Hey, so my name is Lisa Johnson and I'm an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Horticultural Science at North Carolina State University. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to speak with y'all today and it's unfortunate that we can't be together. I of course wish you all well and um, hope that you're finding your way through it as I am. So today we're going to talk about food loss and food waste in agricultural production and where that fits in. Uh, so the title of the presentation is called Lost in the Field, Food Loss in Agricultural Production. I wonder if anybody has seen one of these scenes, um, maybe living out in a rural area or traveling through. Um, watermelons are one of the most visible examples we can see in So what we're going to talk about today is what is food waste and so maybe go through some definitions and how is it important to us, how does it relate to agriculture. We're going to talk about some research at NC State that has been pretty exciting and the first in the nation to dig into this. And a little bit about how post-harvest engineering fits in. And I quickly after that read American Wasteland, which is by Jonathan Bloom, a Durham author, actually. And I was really fascinated by these books and I found them really compelling. I've always been a horticulturist and interested in fruit and vegetable crops. But these particular books were somewhat sensational and really didn't say too much about agricultural production, which is what I'm interested in. So I felt like I had to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, food waste has become really important lately in the media, which you may have seen. Um, there was a book that came out recently called Drawdown that described um, all the solutions people are working on to reverse climate change and reducing food waste actually ranked as the third most important solution that we need to be working on. Um, so it's a pretty hidden but very um, impactful issue. Generally people care about food loss and food waste for one of these uh, reasons, either economic, environmental, or social. One of, you probably all can find yourself in these categories. Um, maybe there's some economists in the group that care more about money or others that care more about people and others that care more about the environment. That's okay. Um, but reducing food loss and waste actually has an impact on all of these things. As you probably know, uh, the global population is increasing pretty rapidly and there are a lot of questions surrounding how we're going to feed everyone. So starting with food waste is kind of a low hanging fruit. Uh, it could be a little more straightforward than trying to produce more than we already produce. A universal kind of global call uh, to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Um, I believe by now most countries have signed on to these SDGs, um, and they give targets and action items, ways to reach all of these goals um, for any country that you're in. You might think food loss and waste fits into number two, uh, with the main goal of no hunger. In fact, it falls under uh, SDG 12, Responsible Consumption. In fact, the U.S. has also adopted the Sustainable Development Goal to reduce food waste. It's actually called Target 12.3, and they aim to cut in half global food waste per capita. 
In fact, here is the head of the FDA, the EPA, and the USDA signing an agreement to work on this in 2018, and they have since renewed those agreements and continued to make it a focus. So let's talk about some definitions. Traditionally in horticulture, we have studied post-harvest loss to a great degree. A lot of people are interested in it. Um, and, a, and a common definition has been quantitative or qualitative reductions in crop volume that occur between harvest and consumption. So you can see there's sort of definite boundaries there between harvest and consumption, uh, uh, reduction in the quality or reduction in the volume of the crop. A sort of more modern definition has emerged of food loss, which is sort of accepted to be a decrease in quantity or quality of food but here they describe reflected in nutritional value, economic value, or food safety of all food produced for human consumption, but not eaten by humans. So there's more than just um, a linear boundary between harvest and consumption. It's all food that's been produced for human consumption, but that wasn't eaten by humans. And it's important to note that this definition uh, was provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, and there are many other definitions. The USDA has its own definition. This one makes sense to me. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see at the bottom of the definition, they say, oh, well, measurement of food loss is a key component of any reduction intervention. So that'll be important later. Measurement of food loss. Now, <clears throat> in contrast, food waste has been defined by the same group as a part of food loss and refers to the discarding or alternative non-food use of safe and nutritious food for human consumption all along food supply chains. Again, the measurement of food waste is a key component of any reduction intervention. So here, um, they describe food waste as a part of food loss. Other definitions might describe food loss as a part of food waste. The Institute defines food waste as food that gets lost at retail and consumption stages, or in general, to refer to wasted food that happens anywhere along the supply chain. And then in contrast, food is lost rather than wasted in production, storage, processing, and distribution stages of the supply chain. So they have actually cut the supply chain into two portions, retailing consumption or later stages, and then production, storage, processing, and distribution, which are more upstream stages of the supply chain. And they say food loss is the unintended result of agricultural processes or technical limitations in storage, infrastructure, packaging, and or marketing. This is where y'all come in. Uh, the result of agricultural processes or technical limitations in storage, infrastructure, packaging, and or, well, marketing. But you can see this is a natural place for post-harvest engineers to plug in. So I wanted to show you this graphic to start to wrap our minds around how much food we're talking about. Um, if it were sneakers or something that one third of the batch didn't make it to a consumer, well, we would be looking into that, right? But imagine if one third of our food doesn't make it to consumption. That's actually the reality. So it's a little bit hard to get our minds around. Many of y'all do not, um, and this slide is for you. Uh, if you are more interested in meat or dairy or grains, what have you, find yourself here and take a look at the losses in that category. You can see here the fruit and vegetable and roots and tubers 
categories have the highest rates of losses out of all of these. Um, and I want you to think about some of the reasons behind that. Maybe why would meat losses be 20% and dairy losses be 30%? This is a really interesting infographic, too, from ReFed, which is an organization um, that works to prevent food loss and waste. If you take a look, you can see that when food is wasted, lots of other resources are wasted as well. Um, in particular, the one we hear a lot about is 21% of U.S. landfill content is food. Uh, the number one contributor by weight. What I find interesting is the ones that relate closely to agriculture, like 19% of all U.S. croplands, 18% of all fertilizer, and 21% of agricultural water is used to produce food that we don't eat. If you're more of an economist, you can see that 218 billion dollars is that billion or trillion i think it's billion equal to 1.3 percent of the u.s gross domestic product is used to produce process package transform transport uh, you know prepare and then dispose of the food that we don't eat. Food system, what we have now is more linear of a system. If you start at the top with food production, then food is distributed, or well, it's aggregated and distributed, then processed maybe, um, then delivered somewhere and marketed, purchased, prepared and consumed. And at this point, we, we don't have as much resource and waste recovery. Um, so this is what it could look like, but it's a real simplified version. I wanted to bring this home for y'all too. Um, it seems like, and this is an estimate that the average family of four is wasting over $1,300 worth of food every year. Um, and it really doesn't matter what your income is, that's a lot of money. And you can see here some reasons for that. Lack of awareness and undervaluing of foods, confusion over date labeling, spoilage, impulse and bulk purchases, poor planning, and then over preparation. I know I've been guilty of some of these, probably you have too, but it's definitely something to watch. This is what is talked about repeatedly and urgently on the consumer level of food waste. Just so we're all on the same page, I want you to be able to understand that um, food loss and waste has been characterized as the world's dumbest problem because we have so much food loss and food waste and we have uh, over 40 million food insecure people in the U.S. So when you put those two problems side by side, it seems really dumb unless you know about all the systems that are in place that both um, aid and exacerbate those problems. The potential is there to meet that social goal of feeding all of those people with the food loss that we have. Uh, it's just getting it to them, right? Harvesting it cooling it, packing it, distributing it. This white paper sort of exploded uh, into the country. It's called Wasted, how America is losing up to 40% of its food from farm to fork to landfill. And it was revisited in 2017 with a newer version. So 40%, you might have heard that in the media. Um, what they have reported there is that 40% of our food in the U.S. never is consumed, right? So there. 
what they did was they took the food supply, uh, what we produce, everything we import, and everything we have in storage, and they subtracted from that the average per capita consumption. And they came up with this figure of 40%. If you're following along with me, you would could be able to tell that there are some food loss and food waste that was left out of that equation, mainly the food that doesn't leave the farm. If it's not reported as yield, it didn't happen, right? It's If it didn't make it off the farm, it's not counted. So the estimates that are up there on the top of where it says production losses, you can see there fruit and vegetables, um, seafood, grain, meat, milk. We really don't know how much those, how long those bars should be. It's possible that they would rival the very long bars at the bottom of the chart that says consumer losses. Consumer losses are very expensive and very environmentally damaging, and so they get a lot of attention. Production losses could be similar in volume or, you know, it, well, in volume, but they wouldn't have the same economic value, nor would they be as environmentally damaging as food that has traveled the entire way through the supply chain. including here at NC State um, and around the world. The national conversation uh, has jumped into solutions before really having all the information. So for example, I went to a conference um, called the U.S. Food Waste Summit. They've had a few uh, by now, and the most promising solutions that they come up with for the agricultural portion of the supply chain or for losses thereof are improvement on donation. That's what people really want to see. Can you think of a reason that makes donation hard for growers? When people talk about solutions, they usually refer back to this food recovery hierarchy, which was put out by the Environmental Protection Agency in 2015. You can see at the top, the, the most preferred method of food recovery uh, is to reduce the volume of surplus food generated. Can you think of a reason why that might be challenging for growers? particularly growers of specialty crops or fruit and vegetable crops. Sure, they don't have a lot of insurance, right? They don't have a lot of backup. They don't get subsidized. So the crops that they plant, they back up with more crops and they back those up with more crops. So they're, they plant in succession in different fields with different conditions to ensure they're going to have enough yield to meet their markets. Would you consider that overplanting? I've definitely gotten into debates with people about whether or not that would be considered overplanting. It's hard to say. I think everybody has their own feeling on that. So that might be really challenging for growers. The second one, the second most preferred way to recover food is to feed hungry people. And we talked about how donation is really exciting as a solution for many people. So if you talk with a grower, you might say to them, well, you know, what about donation? Can you donate more? And you would have to understand that that is a big challenge for growers. Um, they're not making money when they do that. In fact, they might lose money if they are harvesting a crop that they know they can't sell. In some cases, growers might transport crops or pack crops um, for donation, and in that case, they're definitely losing money on that. So that can be hard, it's, and it's difficult to even ask growers to do that. Feeding animals is something growers do often. Um, industrial uses is not really frequently done. Composting is here and there done. Landfill and incineration, not so much. So growers are already 
working on some of these. But um, you can see how these solutions would be a challenge for growers. These are often grouped into prevention, recovery, and recycling, just to make things easy. Remember, this is an environmental organization putting this hierarchy out. Have in your restaurant, in your school, in your factory, in your hotel, there are all of these tools to be able to show you how much you have and where to reverse it. Not so much farms. The farm level projects that have been done have been sort of limited in scope. It's hard to get a grasp on what's happening in each fruit or vegetable crop or each region of the country or if it's a processed vegetable that's machine harvested versus a, a fresh market vegetable that's hand harvested. So not a lot of studies have gotten at how much food is out there. If you take a look at just fruit and vegetable crops, according to the Fruit and Agriculture Organization, or sorry, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, these bars are for different production regions. You can see that the light colored bottom portion of the bar represents fruits and vegetables that have been lost in agricultural production stage of the supply chain. Um, the darker blue in post-harvest uh, and the other ones in processing and distribution and then the red bars in consumption. So again, this is just fruit and vegetables now. Dollar value employs almost 700,000 people, which is really um, remarkable and kind of sobering in the light of the issues we're facing right now. Um, but typically we produce nearly 150,000 acres worth of vegetables, melons, and sweet potatoes. So annual crops, right? Not really fruit. What I wanted to find out with research here at NC State is how much is left behind in the field to try to get at that really dumb problem. How much do we have? Would we be able to use it to feed people? So I designed a project that had all of these objectives. What I really wanted to know was what was left in growers' fields. Um, I had to do, unfortunately, a lot of work to in order to get to a, an easy number. I guess I just wanted an easy number. Um, what I found out is more than I ever would have thought that. The first thing I did was try to identify growers that were going to let me measure in the field. And I started out using these surveys at a grower at a grower conference. What I found out right away is that pretty much nobody wanted to talk to me about uh, something that they perceived as something they had done wrong or a mismanagement issue. Um, so I used these surveys. What they ended up doing was not giving me a lot of data, but opening the conversation to have with growers about surplus or excess crops. I targeted commercial producers in eastern North Carolina who were selling through wholesale channels. Um, and eventually I was able to take these surveys and contact the, the uh, participants later to do interviews with them. And I was able to interview growers managing almost 20% of the acreage in the state. I finally identified growers that were willing to participate in measurement. All right, these growers were working primarily in eastern North Carolina, like I mentioned, and operating almost 20% of the acreage that we have in the state. 
So 20% of that 150,000 acres, uh, some pretty big players. And what I found was their, their sort of average acreage was less than 2,000, but more than 100 acres. So you could say they were small to medium sized growers. One of the first things I found out when talking to them, and you can see in this picture, cabbage left behind in a field. It's not that close up of a picture, but um, that cabbage is perfectly edible and it's going to be disked in uh, because of this reason, how are losses perceived by growers? What I found right away is that growers consider the crop that is left in the field to be of low volume, meaning there's not that much out there, or low value, meaning it's not worth much money. Arguably, that's true, um, but it does have a high nutritional value, right? Or maybe a high social value in that it's caloric, not that caloric, but <laughs> given that it's cabbage. Uh, Growers were not performing measurement in the field. They did not have any way to estimate or understand how much was there, yet they still felt it wasn't that much. The majority of people I talked to did not want to provide an estimate of losses. Those that did gave me some really cryptic numbers that were couched in a lot of ifs, like this example. If you need a percentage, probably 10%, something like that, 15% maybe. And there again, it's just a lot of what's going on in the marketplace. It's hard to figure. So you can see um, that grower didn't know and had some reasons why they didn't know. This next grower said, we know you leave a lot of potatoes in the field. At what percent? If I told you a number, it would just be something I'm pulling out of the air. So they didn't know, had no way of knowing. In any fact. Um, so what I did was I asked them, why were crops left in the field? What caused the crops to be left in the field? Or what would have to be done to get them out. And this is what I heard from growers. For example, on cucumbers. Cucumbers have no salvageable value once you leave fresh market. So once that's over with, it's gone. It's just like cutting off a spigot. So what that tells me is that if they don't have a buyer for that crop, well, they're not going to harvest it anymore, right? We take random samples out of the field, and if we start to see issues, then we're able to make a financial decision at that time whether it's worth continuing to harvest or not, right? Growers keep careful track of the quality in the field, and if it's starting to decline, they may stop harvesting that. So that says quality is really important to growers, right, when they're deciding whether or not to harvest a field. If I'm not going to make enough per bushel to harvest it, I just leave it in the field. I try just to harvest the product in market. That tells us price is critical, right? This is the short answer on why a field wasn't harvested, if you ever wanted to know the short answer. When you have a load or two rejected, most times late in the season, it's because they're overripe. The best thing you can do is just walk away from it. There's a lot of risk involved, right? If they put a, um, an overripe, this was in this case melon, into a box and shipped it to a buyer, that buyer may ship it back or reject it. And who pays for that? You know who pays for that, right? The grower pays for that. So there's a lot of financial risk involved. You'll have another planting that'll come in behind that. We try to plant every three to four weeks so that when that crop's done, we start on a new crop. This makes total sense, right? None of this is rocket science. There are other priorities on the farm. So if one crop in one field is coming on and has really high quality, uh, it's very likely the crew is going to be moved to that field, then abandoning anything that's left from another field that was uh, older and had been harvested several times.
which could evolve into something in the future that helps growers make these decisions. But this is kind of the way growers think when they're coming to the end of the season in one field. Uh, they say to themselves, do I have a ready buyer? Yes, I do. Okay, well, how's the crop's quality? Well, it's not that great. What's my risk of rejection then? Oh, it's a high risk of rejection. This buyer is difficult. Everybody else has tons of produce in the field as well. Um, they're, they'll probably reject it. Then the grower would stop harvesting. For example, if the crop's quality is good and the price is not high enough to support them putting the crew in the field one more time, they're going to stop harvesting the field, right? It makes sense, right? So there's a very slim chance that the field will be harvested again when it comes toward the end of the season. As the food recovery hierarchy from the EPA that we saw earlier didn't really speak to the issues growers have in food recovery, I asked them what would have to happen to get the rest of the crop out of the field. Um, as you're aware, agricultural production is not like a hotel buffet, right? You can't just recover food the same way. So what growers told me is their most preferred option would be, well, the market would have to be consistent and not drop off unexpectedly. And they would have to have prices that stayed consistent or consistently high throughout the season. More infrastructure would be required for processing. Growers would like to sell their surplus or excess to processing, but it doesn't always exist when they need it. Growers would, of course, like to see produce demand increased. You know, these are absolutely things that y'all have probably heard from growers over time. They have told me that they would like to see donation improved uh, by maybe being facilitated with pick up, um, uh, pick up at the farm or maybe being paid for those donations. And there are a number of other uh, ways that they deal with surplus or excess crops that they are willing to work with, such as supporting alternative marketing strategies, uh, modifying grower, uh, sorry, modifying consumer expectations came up, um, Feeding animals and land application are something growers are often doing already. In the field, a lot of different factors have to coalesce in order for harvest to continue on past that point in the season when they feel it's time to stop. And growers have their own ideas for reducing food loss that don't really align with the solutions they are handed by the greater a community, so to speak. So I'm still left with the question, how much is left behind in the field? Well, uh, this is a difficult issue even for growers. Many of the growers that I talked to did not want me measuring what was left behind. And why is that? I touched on it a minute ago, but why would that be? Well, you're not proud of something that's left behind, something that you failed to sell, so to speak. So even after a long and respectful and blame-free conversation on surplus crops, many growers declined to have me in their field measuring how much was there. Maybe they didn't want to know, right? However, several growers were intrigued enough to allow me to measure what was left behind. So what I did was work with growers again in Eastern North Carolina. And I found right away that when you're in the field after the harvest has ended, the produce that's left falls into three very general categories. In every field, whether it's watermelon or sweet corn or bell pepper or tomato, whatever it is, same three categories. 
The first category is quality that is marketable. So this would meet grow buyer specifications for quality. It's the right size, the right color, uh, the right shape. It's the right maturity. It's just right. But the grower is unable to harvest that for some reason. Then there's a portion of the crop that's sitting out in the field that's edible. It's nutritious, safe, healthy, fresh, uh, not over mature, but it might be off size, blemished, misshapen, something like that. Perfectly safe, fresh, and healthy, just doesn't meet those buyer specifications, right? Then there's a portion that we here would consider to be unfit for consumption. It's damaged, diseased, decayed, or over mature. Um, it's bruised, it has um, injury of a progressive nature, however you want to put it, it would not be considered suitable for human consumption in the U.S. Um, in other words, blemishes were uh, too far gone to just cut out, that kind of thing. just asking the grower for some information on the field as far as spacing, when did they harvest the field last, that kind of thing. Um, took, I did sampling in the field by marking off rows and harvesting those rows. Uh, then I sorted the samples into those three categories, weighed them, and then calculated from there what was left in the whole field. Easy, right? So here's just some examples of what that sorting looked like. For example, in bell pepper, um, the data, the, just to show you what it takes to get some of the data that I got, uh, for example, I measured bell pepper on seven dates on three farms in 10 fields. So the final averages that you see come from this data. So for example, here's a chart of some of the results that I saw. This is just showing the mean field size in acres and the number of fields I sampled, the number of farms, the portion of the field area, that kind of thing, some details. And this is what I found, uh, available for harvesting again or recovering. You can see that these are this, uh, sorry, the chart is talking about pounds per acre. And this is what I found. So for example, in cabbage, in the marketable category, I found 274 pounds per acre. It's not that much, right? Cabbage happens to have kind of a wide range of quality that's acceptable in the marketplace. It could be um, two pounds, it could be three pounds, as long as you have a certain number in the box and the box weighs 50 pounds. So uh, as long as the heads are blemish free, then they're suitable. Um, in the edible category, however, there was a lot left, 3,000 pounds per acre, right? And then there was, again, in the inedible category, over 3,000 pounds per acre. So if, if you can see that with me in your mind, there's about enough good cabbage, as much good cabbage as there is bad cabbage. So would it be inefficient to go after the cabbage that's left in the field? Probably you'd be trying, you'd be sorting through and walking past just as much as you would be harvesting. So that does make it inefficient. So that's probably why it's left, right? Uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the numbers I saw. Um, one of the most surprising ones, I guess, if you take a look. Um, Sorry. If you take a look at the marketable sweet potatoes, you can see there were over 3,000 pounds per acre um, in several fields. And in the edible category, uh, there were almost 2,000 pounds per acre. So that's a lot of sweet potatoes left per acre, right? It's a long storing crop. Y'all probably know all about sweet potato. 
Um, but if you look at the inedible category, there's very little there that you have to wade through. So this might be a better candidate for uh, recovery. If you take a look at an example just for fun, uh, marketable bell pepper, 2866 pounds per acre, that's about 114 boxes per acre left. So what you would do is you would need to harvest approximately 10 acres one more time and you'd have another marketable truckload. These are the types of calculations growers are working through uh, when they're trying to decide. marketed yields in North Carolina and you add together the green bar which is the marketable quality and the yellow bar which is the edible quality you can see the percent of the marketed crop that was still left behind in the field for example if you look at cucumber uh, there was almost 70% of the crop was left in the field again. So what that means is if you marketed 100 boxes of cucumber from that from one field, there was still 65 or 70 more boxes of cucumber that were marketable and edible sitting in that field when you're done. Now, if you look Obviously, the green bar is smaller. This, there was a smaller portion of that that would have been considered marketable and a large portion that would be considered edible. And you can see it's different in every crop, right? Uh, so here is the line uh, showing 10%, right? We, what we thought to be true in data or estimates that we saw from the 1960s is that about 10% of the crop should be sitting out there in the field, right? Uh, in fact, this study suggests that estimates should be a lot higher. What I found was an average of 42% lost in the field. So how would these type of quantities that I saw in the field impact food insecurity? Well, as you can imagine, it's pretty dramatic, right? Um, in cabbage, I found on average 2,600 pounds or 2,600 acres were planted and there were 3,300 pounds per acre that were left behind. You just multiply those together and see, you know, 8.6 million pounds of cabbage were left behind on average, an estimate, right, uh, from 2017. So I did that for a handful of crops and found that potentially there was a lot of food left behind in 2017. Now, um, and if you look at uh, sweet potato, including the marketable and the edible sweet potato, there were a little over 5,000 pounds left per acre. Of course, that's our most important crop in North Carolina. Uh, we had about 90,000 acres that year. And so that looks a little like under half a billion pounds of sweet potato. When you do some of that math um, in the state of North Carolina at that time, there were 1,659,050 people considered food insecure in the state. And this amount of food would have equaled 350 pounds per person. So this is where you can really get to the meat of what a dumb problem it is. Um, and what are the hurdles that we have? Our harvest and distribution system. So that's where it would be great to see y'all jumping in and solving some of those issues. Is that growers really need connections to markets for all the, for the variety of quality that they may have in the field, whether it's marketable or not marketable typically, right? So what we try to do is connect growers to markets that they may or may not know about in this region so that they could sell a wider range of quality from their farms. So that worked out pretty successfully.
Uh, another way that we were trying to help growers find um, ways to move their surplus was just to make sure they're aware of the benefits of donation. There are tax benefits that can be utilized uh, to where growers can at least receive some kind of benefit for working with the emergency food system. So we put this video out and um, have distributed it. Uh, we found that there was a lack of processing opportunities in North Carolina, and we wanted to determine if growers could process crops themselves. You can see here's Justin and I. Um, what we had done is consider that a mobile dehydrator unit would be great to adapt to a whole bunch of crops, share between growers, and it was designed and built by Justin Michalek in Bio and Ag Engineering. Um, we found that for this type of unit and sharing it between farms, the food safety testing would be prohibitively expensive and dehydrator use might be limited to processing facilities rather than farms who potentially couldn't free up someone else to work on this project. The last part of the crop, it takes longer to get it out of the field, right? So here's a picture of a Johnson digger, and this kind of inspired us when we were trying to uh, come up with harvest solutions. And over time, um, this kind of prototype harvest aid was designed by Justin Michalek again, uh, and he designed this adjustable harvest aid to allow growers to use a small crew to finish the field and or improve the efficiency of gleaning, which is the act of gathering the crop that's left behind. Uh, we hoped that this Equipment would be suitable for all of our really important crops in North Carolina, bell pepper, cucumber, squash, cabbage, sweet potato, greens, tomato, eggplant, broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, cantaloupe, and others, right? And you can see the design here. Uh, in action, it looks like this. We call it the glean machine, and there you can see some bio and ag engineering friends working on the glean machine in a field of beets. Um, growers do need affordable solutions to make the harvest more efficient, and this unit was affordable to build. It's adjustable to a lot of different crops and adaptable to a lot of different crops. Here it is again, same thing. <laughs> Here it is from the driver's seat, and you can see Jay is driving with a, sort of a joystick steering system that I like to say he can set it and forget it. So as soon as he gets the glee machine traveling in a straight line, he can also be harvesting rather than steering the unit.
so uh, one of I think this is the last project I want to tell you about. The thing that grower growers really want to know when talking about surplus crops is can they profit from going back in the field one more time? So using some sort of economic analysis, we can determine whether or not it's worth it for them to return to the field based on a set of assumptions and with all the price information that we have. Critically, in this exercise, we assume that a market exists, right? That somebody wants this product. So what we did was examine these different scenarios for harvest and sale to see if they would be profitable or not. Uh, the first scenario would be to pack, to carry the whole crop to the packing house and pack it into bins and sell into the alternative marketplace for a price of 50% of the wholesale price. For example, to one of these ugly produce distributors like Hungry Harvest or Imperfect. Typically, they offer growers about 50% of the wholesale price. In the second scenario, we could field pack the product in bins and not take it to the packing house and sell it to our emergency food system or into a food bank for about seven cents a pound. Food banks typically will offer between five and 10 cents a pound, depending on what the crop is. Uh, and then in scenario three and four, we did a combination of these. So if you carry the entire crop into the packing house, um, put the marketable portion into cartons and put the edible portion into bins and sell the bins for 50% wholesale, that's scenario three. In scenario four, you would carry everything to the packing house, um, pack all of the marketable product into cartons, and then keep the edible product, the edible quality product in bins and sell it to the food bank. Maybe you can already see which scenario is going to be the best. Dollars per acre, basing the calculation on what was left in the field, and then if as they were marketed under these scenarios. You can see there's kind of a pattern. Um, there are three crops that would generate some additional profit if they were marketed under these scenarios. So in the case of bell pepper, there were several scenarios in which money could be made. Um, in cucumber, there were a couple of scenarios and in sweet potato, a couple of scenarios. Um, after looking on this data for a while, we can really say that bell pepper and sweet potato are both sort of higher value crops, and there's enough left in the field to make this worthwhile. With, with cucumber, it's not as high value of a crop, but there is so much left that if you did all that work to pack it and sell it, um, it would give you an additional return. <clears throat> In the case of cabbage, uh, we talked about uh, it's not that efficient to go and get the rest of it, and um, there's not that much of it to begin with. In summer squash, unfortunately, it matures so quickly that there's a very small portion of edible and marketable uh, crop out in the field. And in sweet corn, I think the price is too low generally to make money on going back into the field. But there are reasons behind all of these. So what we wanted to show is that it's possible that it would be worthwhile to take a second look at what time or when growers are stopping their harvest. So a couple of take home messages for you. Um, one, if you think all the way back to the beginning, there's no real agreed upon definition right now of food loss and food waste. Um, so that's there. You might have your own definition. There's a lack of data in many areas, in particular in agricultural production. It's still largely a mystery to people. 
um, when people talk about food loss and food waste, they also talk around continents and countries and states. So it kind of makes understanding it a challenge. Uh, when growers want to make a profit and food recovery organizations want to recover food, those goals might be competing. And the last and final take home message where we need people like you uh, is that innovation is needed in harvest and distribution so that uh, this food can make it to the hands of people around the world. And how this 20% was an estimate from the 60s, and a lot has changed since the 60s, right? Um, all the cultivars we use, um, we use customized fertility blends, really optimized irrigation strategies. In some cases, the spacing might be different. In a few cases, the quality standards may have changed as well. Nearly everything has changed, right, in fruit and vegetable production since the 60s. So it's time, really, that this number is changed as well. This 20% was an estimate. Kind of irresponsible. Here, I took away everything else so we can just look at North America. It would be kind of irresponsible to take the numbers that I saw in North Carolina and just add them into this North American estimate. But I'm going to do it anyway to show you where we might be instead of losing a little over 50% of our fruit and vegetable crops. It looks like we might be losing 80 to 90% of our fruit and vegetable crops. Hopefully that's enough of a jump to spur everyone into action that loves specialty crops like I do. Uh, and again, remember there's that 10% that's, I guess, lost in packing. And then I put on top of that the 42% that I found, all lost in agricultural production. If you're interested in more information on this, I've put out a lot of publications. Uh, the first one is an extension publication showing growers how to do measurement on their own. It's not challenging. Growers know exactly how to do it. It's a lot like um, determining yield potential. So the calculations, the sampling is a lot like something that they already do. Uh, and there are also two videos about sampling and measurement in the field called Finding Opportunity in the Field. One it uses sweet potato as an example, and one uses cucumber. If you search on YouTube for Seth's cucumber or Seth's sweet potato, they will come up. Uh, and there are all kinds of um, academic articles on this issue, then uh, an economic I uh, can't take your questions, but if you do please reach out to me. I have been on this deep dive for a long time, and I would love to hear from you if you have questions. My email is l underscore johnson at ncsu.edu. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you take care.